Welcome to Orozco's Lectures. I am Jose Orozco, and these are my lectures. This lecture is a Calculus 1 lecture. I hope you enjoy it. This is 4.2, which is Rho's Theorem. And the mean value theorem. All right, so let's start first with Rose theorem. All right, so theorem, Rose theorem. And this is what Rose theorem says. It says, let F be continuous on the closed interval AB and differentiable on the open interval AB. If f of a equals f of b, right? So if the value of the function is the same at either endpoint of the function, of the interval, excuse me, of the closed interval, then <clears throat> there exists at least one value of c. such that, well, one value of C in the interval from A to B, in the open interval from A to B, such that F prime of C is equal to zero, all right? So let's see, so let's, let's read that. So it says, let F be continuous on the closed interval, okay? So it must, so the function must be continuous for this to apply, what else? And differentiable. So it must be differentiable on the open interval. So continuous and differentiable, okay? If f of a equals f of b, so if the values of the function is at the same height at either endpoint in the interval, then there exists at least one value, c, such that f prime of c is zero. Recall that f prime of c equals zero was essentially saying that it is a critical value, right? It's a critical point. Um, now, specifically here, since we said that it must be differentiable, that means that f prime of c must exist. So in here, Rolle's theorem is essentially telling us that if we have a continuous uh, function, a continuous differentiable function, um, and at both endpoints it's at the same height, well, somewhere in the middle, we must have a horizontal tangent line. All right. In other words, a relative minimum or a relative maximum. All right. So visually speaking, what are we saying there? So we're saying something like this, right? Um, if I had, for example, here's my interval from A to B, and it must be a closed interval, and we must be defined at both endpoints, but more importantly, at both endpoints, we must have the same height. So let's say we had a function that looks something like this, right? And essentially what Rolle's theorem is telling us is that this point is guaranteed up here. This point is guaranteed down here, right? How come? Because in here we have a horizontal tangent line, all right, which again was given by this, all right? Um, so in here we've got f prime of c sub 1 being equal to 0, and here f prime of c sub 2 being equal to 0. Again, a horizontal tangent line. Um, Another way to think about Rolle's theorem is it's saying that um, given that these two are at the same height, well, somewhere in the middle, we must have a horizontal tangent line. So somewhere in the middle, we, we must have lines that are parallel to that. All right. All right. So there we go. So let's do an example. So in here, I'm going to say find the x-intercepts of f of x equals x squared plus 6x and show that f prime of c equals 0 at some point between 
the x-intercepts. All right. <clears throat> so here we go. Find the x-intercepts. Well, how do we find x-intercepts? The x-intercepts happen at where where y is equal to zero, right? All the x-intercepts happen there. So let's figure out what that means. So here I've got f of x equals x squared plus 6x. If I set that equal to zero and factor, I have x times x plus 6 equals zero. So either x equals zero or x equals negative 6. All right. <clears throat> and notice again that these were the, the x-intercepts, right? So clearly the intercepts are at the same height. So of zero, right? This is the point zero, zero and the point negative 6, zero. So, so far in here, clearly f of 0 equals f of negative 6. So, that's the interval that we're working in, right? <clears throat> we're working between, well, I should be saying for between negative 6 and 0. So, I'll change the order here. So, f of negative 6 must be f is equal to f of 0. All right. Now, let's see how, how we can apply Rolle's theorem to this. Well, again, needed to be continuous and differentiable. So continuous on the open interval. Well, in here, I mean, continuous in the closed interval. In here, f of x is a polynomial. Polynomials are continuous throughout the entire real line. So it's definitely continuous throughout that interval between negative 6 and 0. The other thing that we said is that it needed to be differentiable. All right, well, let's see what that means. Um, to see things about the differentiability, we need to be working with the derivative. So let's figure out what f prime is. So that's 2x plus 6. All right. So is this function differentiable? Well, essentially, another way to, to rephrase that question is, is there any value that you can plug in into its derivative that would make it undefined? All right. Because if you can make the, the, the derivative undefined, well, at that point, it would not be differentiable all right well there's no value um, that i can plug into here that would make this undefined so this is differentiable so we have continuous on the closed interval yes in here differentiable on the open interval between negative six and zero also yes right because well this is differentiable everywhere so continuous everywhere, differentiable everywhere. So what we have now is we have these three conditions, right? The, the endpoints are the same. It's continuous. It's differentiable. So by Rolle's theorem, there exists a C, some value C, in the interval between negative 6 and 0 right, in the open interval, such that f prime of c is zero, done, right? As far as the problem is concerned, we're done, all right? It didn't ask to find it, right? It says show that, that it exists somewhere in that interval. And how do we show it? We showed it using um, Rolle's theorem, right? Um, but let's find it. Let's find it. So this is essentially an addendum to this prior problem. Let's find it. Let's find C. So, well, f prime of C must be equal to zero. So I need to get two x plus six. I set that equal to zero, move the six over, divide by two, x is equal to negative three. All right. So this value of negative three, that's where um, we're gonna have a minimum, an relative max or a relative min, right? It's a critical point, and that's what uh, we were guaranteed by Rolle's theorem. Visually speaking, we're working with this scenario. We've got here a parabola, something like that, where this value is negative 6 and this value is 0, right? They're both at the same height. This is a continuous function, and we found here that at negative 3, this value right here has a horizontal tangent line, right? Which was guaranteed by Rolle's theorem. So here, f prime of negative three is zero, right? Um, 
All right. So now let's uh, let's do more examples. Um, the next couple of examples are going to have the same exact um, instructions. So let's go ahead and write them. It says determine whether Rolle's theorem applies. If it does, find the values, or I should say the value or values of C guaranteed by it. If it doesn't, so if it doesn't apply, explain why. Explain why not. All right. So, all right. So here we go. Example B. Here we've got f of x is equal to x squared minus 2x over x plus 2. And we're working on the interval from negative 1 to 6. All right. So let's see. For Rho's theorem to apply, we needed to have a couple of things. First, we need to make sure that the function is continuous. Well, let's figure out the overall domain here. The domain for this function is x cannot be equal to negative 2. How did I find that? Set the bottom to be 0, right? That's what we make the, the denominator 0. So x can't be equal to negative 2. So is that a problem? Well, that's not an issue because negative 2 is not in the interval that we're working in. And we know that overall, functions are continuous throughout their entire domain. And here this domain was x is not negative two, so it's continuous everywhere else. So definitely continuous on that interval. So continuous on negative one to six, yes it is. The next question, is it differentiable, right? The next part question is differentiable. So let's figure out if it is differentiable. So f prime of x would be, well, here I need to do the quotient rule, right? The derivative of the top, 2x minus 2 times the bottom, x plus 2 minus the derivative of the bottom, 1 times the top, x squared minus 2x, all over the bottom, squared. All right, let's, uh, let's manipulate this a little bit. I'm going to factor out this 2 out of this, just so that I can look at it as 2 times x minus 2, not x minus 2, x minus 1. You know what? I won't factor it. That's fine. I'll just distribute the way it is. Um, so now, foiling this out. 2x times x, 2x squared. 2x times 2, 4x. Negative 2 times x, negative 2x. Negative 2 times 2, negative 4. Distributing this negative 1, negative x squared plus 2x. All of this over x plus 2 squared. Simplifying this, in other words, combining like terms, 2x squared minus x squared is x squared. 4x minus 2x, that's 2x, plus 2x, that's 4x, and then minus 4. All of this over x plus 2 squared, right? Now, the question here is, well, is this differentiable? Well, um, <clears throat> again, another way to think about differentiability is... Well, is there anything that would make this undefined? Well, what would make this undefined? Well, we have a fraction. So x equals negative 2 would make this undefined, right? Because it would make the bottom 0. However, that's not in the interval that we care about, right? From negative 1 to 6. So what we found here is that this is differentiable everywhere, right? Because the only place that it would not be differentiable would be at negative 2. So in here, differentiable on the open interval from negative 1 to 6. Yes, so we've got continuous, we've got differentiable. The next thing that we need to do is, is a function the same at either endpoint? Well, let's see. Um, f of negative 1, what would that be? Well, the function again was negative, well, x squared minus 2x over x plus 2. So what does that give us? That gives us 1 plus 3 
over the 1, right? Negative 1 squared, negative and negative is a positive. I don't know where I got that 3 from. That should have been a 2. 1 plus 2, there we go. And then negative 1 plus 2 is 1. So 1 plus 2 is 3, 3 over 1, 3. Cool. Now, is that the same as at the other endpoint? So at 6, well, 6 squared minus 2 times 6 over 6 plus 2. 6 squared is 36, 2 times 6 is 12, 6 plus 2 is 8, 36 minus 12 is 24, and that over 8 is 3. Good. So in here we got that at either endpoint, we are at the same height. So by Rolle's theorem, AC in the interval between negative 1 and 6 exists such that f prime of c is equal to 0. All right. So, so in here, yes, Rolle's theorem applies. So let's figure out <clears throat> what value it guarantees. And again, it guarantees that f prime of c is equal to 0. Well, let's figure out what that means. If you recall our, our derivative, where did I put it? Ah, uh, there it is. It's x squared plus 4x minus 4. So f prime of x plus x squared plus 4x minus 4 over um, x plus 2 squared. And we want to set this equal to 0 to find the value of c that's guaranteed by this, right? So that equal to zero. What do I get? Well, I've got a fraction here equaling zero. So what that tells me now is that x squared plus 4x minus 4 must be equal to zero. How come? I've got a fraction. The only way that a fraction can be equal to zero is if the numerator itself is equal to zero. All right. So how do we solve this? <clears throat> well, we say, let's try to factor that. Well, not factorable because there's no two values or not two uh, real numbers here that if I were to try to multiply them, would multiply to negative 4 and add up to positive 4, right? Um, you may think 2 and negative 2, but those don't add up to positive 4, right? Um, so now, how do we do that? Well, we know that when we cannot factor, we have to use the quadratic formula. And as a reminder, this is the quadratic formula, so I'll put it on the side over here x equals negative v plus or minus the square root of v squared minus 4ac all over 2a. All right? That is the quadratic formula. So let's apply it here. And in here, that's going to give us that x is equal to, well, the negative of v, in this case 4, plus or minus the square root of v squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times a. So what does that give me? That gives me, well, negative 4 plus or minus the square root of 16 plus 16, right? 4 squared, 16. Negative 4 times 1 times negative 4, positive 16. All of this over 2. So I get negative 4 plus or minus radical 32 over 2, which is actually negative 4 plus or minus 4 radical 2 over 2, right? 32 is 16 times 2. The square root of 16 is 4, and the other 2 is still there. All right. So at this point, well, I see that I can rewrite this as two fractions. So in other words, negative 4 over 2 plus or minus 4 radical 2 over 2. And those 4s over 2s can reduce. So I end up with negative 2 plus or minus uh, 2 radical 2. All right. So in here, well, let's think about these two values because in here we've got two things. We've got negative 2 plus 2 radical 2 and negative 2 minus 2 radical 2. So one of these has to be on the interval. Well, how would I how would I know without even looking at a calculator? Well, let's recall the interval that we were in. Negative 1 to 6. We're working from negative 1 to 6. Negative 2 minus anything is going to be further to the left, right? 
So let's think about this. So here's negative 1, here's 6, here's negative 2. Negative 2 minus 2 radical 2 is going to be somewhere on this side. Right? Negative 2 minus 2 radical 2. So that forces this one to actually be in the interval that we care about. All right? <clears throat> that one actually is on the interval because it's going to be to the right somewhere. This one's definitely not in the interval, so this is guaranteed to be in the interval. Um, as far as what its decimal value is, well, negative 2 minus 2 radical 2 um, is approximately negative 4 point that's me negative 2 minus 2 radical 2 this value right here was approximately negative 4.83 but if i did it with the plus right negative 2 sorry um technical difficulty so if i had negative 2 plus 2 radical 2 then at that point i would end up with 0 0.8 so somewhere around here well let's make it a little here 0 0.83 all right <clears throat> so in here well yeah this value is definitely there right this is negative 2 plus 2 radical 2 so what we found here is that the value guaranteed by the Rolle's theorem that c is negative 2 plus 2 radical 2 and that f prime of that value is zero, right? I mean, we found that c using that f prime of c is zero. All right, let's do another example. So that was b, c. And here's what we have for c. C, we've got f of x being tangent of x, and we're working on the interval from 0 to pi. <clears throat> All right. So let's try to see if uh, Rolle's theorem applies. All right. So we know that the endpoints must be the same. So let's see. f of 0 will be tangent of 0, which is 0. Good. OK. f of pi. Well, that would be tangent of pi, which is sine of pi over cosine of pi, which is 0. Right? Sine of pi is 0. Uh, irrelevant of what cosine is uh, up here well perhaps i'll be more explicit in both of these so we have here sine of zero over cosine of zero which is zero over one which is zero here we have sine of pi over cosine of pi and that's not how pi looks like there we go <clears throat> and sine of pi is zero but cosine of pi is negative one so again i end up with zero good but just because the endpoints are equal doesn't mean it applies, that Rolle's theorem applies yet. We have to make sure it's continuous on that interval. So is it continuous? Well, let's, con let's consider the domain. The domain um, of tangent is that x cannot be equal to um, pi over 2 plus or minus, or plus, I'll just write it as plus n pi right where n is just any integer now in here well let's say let's let n equal zero if i let n equal zero i get x cannot be equal to pi over two but that's a problem because pi over two is in that interval so in here well this is not continuous throughout the entire interval so not continuous which implies that Rolle's theorem does not apply. All right. So in here, let's uh, let's look at a, at the visual uh, for this one in that interval from zero to pi. All right. Um, so let's draw. And tangent has asymptotes at negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Let's say that this value right here is pi. Um, so this value right here, so this would be negative pi, sorry, and this is pi. And this is what tangent looks like, all right?
specifically in the interval that we cared about, we cared about um, from 0 to pi, right? And in here, well, it's not continuous. Well, because it's not continuous there, Rolle's theorem doesn't apply, right? So, so again, what we're saying there is there's no point in between 0 and pi such that the function has a relative minimum or a relative maximum, all right? Because nowhere in there will the... So, hold on, let me rephrase that. So, there's no guaranteed value. There we go. It is not guaranteed that there's a value between 0 and pi such that um, it is a relative minimum or maximum, right? It's not guaranteed. Um, and in here, I mean, clearly there isn't any. All right, so now, so here, Rolle's theorem does not apply. All right, so next example, D. So let's say f of x is equal to x squared minus 2x times e to the x. And here, we're going to be working on the interval from 0 to 2. All right, so again, let's check the endpoints, right? Because if the endpoints... Then points are easy to check, and if those are, if they're not the same, Rolle's theorem doesn't apply right away. So f of 0, 0 squared minus 2 times 0, so 2 times 0 times e to the 0. So I have 0 times 1 equals 0, okay? Let's figure out the other endpoint, f of 2. So I have here um, 2 squared minus 2 times 2 times e squared. 2 squared is just 4. 2 times 2 is 4. So I have 4 minus 4, which is 0, times e squared, 0. So in here, endpoints are the same. f of 0 is equal to f of 2, right? Which is good. So, so maybe, maybe it does apply. Let's see. What else did we need? We needed to make sure this was Continuous. So the question is, is it continuous on that interval from 0 to 2, on the closed interval? Well, yes it is. How come? Because in here, this function right here, x squared minus 2x, that's a polynomial. That's continuous everywhere. e to the x, that exponential function, continues everywhere. So in here, when I have the product of two functions, of two continuous functions, well, it's going to be continuous throughout. So it is continuous. Is it differentiable on the open interval from uh, 0 to 2? Uh, let's see. Well, how do we check? Well, we need to figure out the derivative, right? And see if there's any value that would make it undefined. So let's see. Let's find the derivative of this. And here, I'm going to apply the product rule, all right? So applying the product rule here, um, I have f prime of x is, well, the derivative of the first, which is 2x minus 2, times the second, e to the x, plus the derivative of the second, well, the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x, times the first, so x squared minus 2x. Um, simplifying this, well, I see they both have an e to the x. So let's factor out an e to the x. So I'm left with 2x minus 2 plus x squared minus 2x. Combining like terms, 2x minus 2x cancel each other out. So I end up with just x squared minus 2, right? These two cancel each other out. So I have e to the x times x squared minus 2. All right, is that differentiable though? So is there any value that would make this undefined? Well, in here, x squared minus 2, the domain for that piece is all real numbers. In here, e to the x, domain for that piece is all real numbers. So, there's nothing that would make this f prime of x undefined. So, differentiable, yes. It's differentiable everywhere. So, it must be differentiable on that open interval, right? So we've got continuous, we've got differentiable, we've got that both endpoints are at the same height, right? Um, so, so now let's find where that is. So in here, thus, 
Rawls theorem applies. And since the instruction were to find that value would, that, that this guarantees, right? So Rawls theorem is guaranteeing that there's some value in the interval such that f prime of that value is zero. So let's see. Sorry, scrolling the wrong way. So let's get this derivative set it equal to zero. So e to the x times x squared minus two set it equal to zero. So that gives me that either e to the x is equal to zero or x squared minus two is equal to zero. From this one, we get no solution, right? Because there's no value. There's no real value that I can plug into here to make that equal to zero. On this one, I get x is equal to plus or minus radical two, right? Take, move the two over, take square root, and make sure you apply the plus or minus. Now in here, what is the interval that we're working in? We were working from zero to two. So in here we have positive radical two and negative radical two. Well, we don't care about negative radical two because it's not in the interval that we're working in. So this is the value guaranteed by Rolle's theorem, right? So c is equal to radical two and f prime of radical two is zero. I, I don't even have to check it, right? I already know because I found it by setting the derivative equal to zero, right? F prime of x here, we set that equal to zero. All right, so let's get a visual as to what this is, right? Um, this function looks something like this. Uh, let's draw that a little bit better. Yeah, that is a little bit better. All right, so here, this is our zero, this is our two, and this point right here, this is at uh, radical two, right? And this, in here, we have a horizontal tangent line, all right? That's what we were guaranteed by Rolle's theorem. Notice that up here, I would also have a horizontal tangent line, but we weren't really concerned about that because we were looking at just the interval from zero to two. In fact, we already know what where that happens. It would happen at negative radical two, right? But again, we were not concerned with that <coughs> in this problem. So in here we found this f prime of radical two is equal to zero. All right. So that was all the um, Rolle's theorem, right? That was all Rolle's theorem. Actually, let me do one last example before we move we move on from Rolle's theorem. So e. So here I have f of x is equal to x to the two-thirds, and we're working on the interval from zero to one. So in here, is this continuous? Well, actually before that, let's go ahead and figure out what happens at both endpoints here. So let's see. f of zero, zero to the two-thirds is zero. f of one, one to the two-thirds, that's not zero it's one. So in here, right away, Rolle's theorem does not apply. All right. But let's change this up a little bit. Let's look at it on the interval from negative one to one. All right. So let's see. F of negative one negative one to the two thirds. Well, negative one cube root is negative one squared is positive one. So I get positive one there. Um, F of one. F of one is gonna be one to the two thirds, which is one. Okay, so here we found that at the end point, it is the same. All right, so so, so far it's looking okay for, um, for Rolle's theorem. The next thing we got to figure out, well, is this continuous and differentiable throughout that entire interval? Well, continuous, well, yes, how come? Well, the domain for this function is all real numbers, right? Um, I can think of this f of x as um, 
the cube root of x squared. And the thing about the cube root of x is that its domain is all real numbers, right? There, even, even if I put negatives in there, right? Like, for example, if I had the cube root of, well, I already did it, right, of negative 1. The cube root of negative 1 is negative 1. So there's nothing wrong with having negatives or positives or fractions or 0, right? There's nothing wrong with that. So in here, it's continuous everywhere. It's a differentiable um, in that interval. Well, let's see. We got to figure out what f prime of x is. So f prime of x would be 2 thirds x to the negative 1 third, right? Bring the exponent down, subtract 1 from the exponent, which I can rewrite as 2 over 3 times the cube root of x. Now, in here, this, the domain for f prime is that x can't be 0, right? So it's essentially here, what I'm getting at is that when we're looking for this to be differentiable, we're looking at the interval. Is every value in there, can we plug that into the derivative? Well, it turns out no, because f prime of, f prime of 0 is undefined. So that implies not differentiable on that interval, on well, on the open interval, from negative 1 to 1, all right? It is continuous, and we do have that the endpoints are at the same height, right? The endpoints at negative 1 and 1, they're at the same height of 1. It is continuous, but it is not differentiable. So because it's not differentiable, that tells us that Rolle's theorem does not apply. Right? So, Rolle's theorem does not guarantee that this has um, a point somewhere in the middle such that its horizontal tangent line is, excuse me, so such that its tangent line is horizontal. Alright, so let me, let me restate that. So, because Rolle's theorem does not apply, then it is not guaranteed that in that interval between negative 1 and 0, it's not guaranteed that it will have any horizontal tangent line throughout that interval. And in fact, let's look at a visual here. Here's the visual. And this is what that function looks like. All right. So it kind of looks like this. All right. Kind of looks like that where in here, this is at negative 1. Here, this is at 1. Not drawn to scale. Hmm. So they're at the same height. And in here, this is at 0. And in here, well, even though we do have a minimum here, it is technically a relative minimum, we do not have a point that it has a horizontal tangent line. If you think about what the tangent line at that point would look like, well, it would actually be something like this. It would be a vertical tangent line, right, at that point. How come? Because we have a cusp there. We have a corner. So, if you recall, functions are not differentiable at cusps, which is what's happening here, all right? So, it's not differentiable. So, functions are not differentiable at cusps, meaning this function is not differentiable at zero, and thus, it's not differentiable throughout, so the Rolle's theorem does not apply. All right, so that was Rolle's theorem. Now, let me move on to something called um, the mean value theorem. And here's what the mean value theorem says. Well, first of all, um, the mean value theorem is essentially just a generic Rolle's theorem. So let's see um, what it says, and then I'll give you the visual and the comparison to the Rolle to, to, to Rolle's theorem. So here's what it says: If f is continuous on the closed interval a b and differentiable on the open interval a b then 
there exists C in the interval between A and B, right? So there exists some C in the open interval. Touch that. F prime of C is equal to F of B minus F of A over B minus A. All right. Now, this right hand side, F of B minus F of A, that should look familiar. In general, that is a formula for a slope, for a slope of a secant line. So let's see what we mean here. Let's get at the visual. So we're saying things like, let's say that I have this curve, right? And in here, notice that we don't care whether A, the function at A and at B are at the same height. That's what makes this more of a generic uh, Rolle's theorem, right? because we don't care about that. Now in here, let's say that we had this curve. Um, and that was awful. Let's try it again. There we go. Let's say that we have that curve, right? Um, what this is saying is that, well, let's check out what f of b minus f of a is. f of b minus f of a, well, we just said it was the slope of this secant line. So in here, this is the slope there is f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So we found, or what this is telling us is that, well, c, somewhere between a and b, there must be a c such that its tangent line, the tangent line at that point, at that c, is parallel to the secant line throughout the interval. All right, this point right here being c, this right here being the slope being um, f prime of c. All right, so that's what this is telling us. Now, let's quickly compare it to Rolle's theorem. All right, and I'm gonna scroll up to Rolle's theorem real quick. Where is it? All right, so here in Rolle's theorem, right? Notice here that if I take that secant line there and I do f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Well, since f of a and f of b were the same here, I end up with 0 over b minus a, which is just 0. So the slope of this line is 0, which happens to be the slope of this tangent line and this tangent line. All right. So the mean value theorem actually accounts for Rolle's theorem. It's just a more generic version. Over here now, where is it? Um, there it is. Over here now, we're just doing it more generically on any two points. We don't have to have them at the same height, right? But the same idea applies that the there exists some point in between A and B in the interval such that the tangent line is parallel to the secant line going through the entire interval. All right. All right. So now let's uh, let's do some examples with the mean value theorem. All right. So let's say, determine if the mean value theorem, and I'll be abbreviating MVT, determine if the mean value theorem applies. If it does, so I'll put it in the next line. If it does, find the value of C guaranteed by it. If it doesn't, explain why not. All right, so here we go. Um, example F. So let's look at f of x equals x to the two thirds, and now we're going to go from zero to one. Okay. Now I know that we attempted this in example e right at the at first, but the problem with that one was that the endpoints weren't the same, right? But now we don't care about the endpoints being the same, right? So we don't even have to check that. 
what we do need to check is that it is continuous and differentiable um, in the open intervals. So continuous, well, as before, well, like, like we said, f of x here is just um, the cube root of x squared. And the domain for that is all real numbers. So we know that functions are continuous through its domain. So because its domain is all real numbers, yes, it is continuous and it must be continuous in that interval. Um, but I want to make a, something explicit here. And here for continuity, we should be saying continuous on the closed interval. And again, we said yes, because it's continuous everywhere, so it must be continuous on that interval. Is it differentiable on the open interval from 0 to 1? Ah, so is this differentiable on 0 to 1? Well, if you recall from before, where did I do it? Here it is. From before, this right here was the derivative. I'm just going to go ahead and copy that. Oh, didn't mean to erase it. I wanted to copy it. There we go. So, <clears throat> let's see. In here, we had said that f prime of 0 is undefined. All right? But that doesn't matter here. Why does it not matter? Because it needs to be differentiable on the open interval. So not including 0. It needs to be differentiable between 0 and 1, but not at 0 and not at 1. This is not differentiable at 0, but who cares? We don't care about it being differentiable at 0. So is it differentiable between 0 and 1? Yes. So in here, we have, yes, differentiable. All right. Now, what does that mean? Well, now, now that means that um, the mean value theorem applies. Mean value theorem applies. And what we need to have here is, well, we need to find some f prime of c such that f of b minus f of a over is some f prime of c. Some well, let me rephrase that. Uh, we need to find some c such that f prime of c is equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Okay, so in here, let's do this. So what was f prime of x? f prime of x was 2 thirds cube root of x. So f prime of c would be 2 thirds cube root of c. All right, and we want to solve for that c. Now, f of b minus f of a. I'm going to just shift this down a little bit. All right, f of b minus f of a. So that's going to be f of 1 minus f of 0 over 1 minus 0. All right, so simplifying this. The function, remember, and I'll remind you over here, f of x was um, x to the 2 thirds. All right? So f of 1, f of 1 would be 1 to the 2 thirds, which is just 1. f of 0, 0 to the 2 thirds is just 0. And on the bottom, I still have 1 minus 0. So in here, um, what we found is that, well, this, this part over here, 1 minus 0 over 1 minus 0 is just 1. So I have now 2 thirds cube root of C is equal to 1. Multiply both sides by the cube root of 3. So, excuse me, by the cube root of C. So I end up with 2 thirds is equal to uh, cube root of C. At that point, well, what we want to do is cube both sides to get rid of that cube root. And what we get is that C is equal to 8 over 27. All right. So that's the value. So at, at 8 over 27, we would have that the tangent line is parallel to the secant line on that interval. So let's let's see what that what that means. Um, so again, this is the function, right? And the function looks like this. Uh, not drawn to scale. And what do we have? Let's see. Let's say that this value right here is 1. And this value right here is 0. And this value right here we cared about. And this value right here we cared about. Um, 
what we found is well let's see this line or this secant line close enough this secant line has some slope and it turns out that at 8 over 27 the tangent line would also have the same slope all right in other words it would be parallel and at this point that's 8 over 27. so again what we're finding there is the point at which these two are parallel all right <clears throat> So there you go. Let's do another one. So that was F G. Let's say that I have F of X is equal to X log base two of X. And we're working on the interval um, from one to two. All right. So is this continuous? Well, let's think about the domain here. The domain for x is all real numbers. The domain for log base anything of x is that the inside must be non-negative. It must be greater than zero. All right. Um, so let me rephrase that. Not just non-negative. It must be greater than zero. So it must be specifically positive. So the domain is that x must be greater than zero overall. Well. That's fine because the interval that we're working in is completely greater than zero, and like all those values are greater than zero, so that tells us that this is continuous in that interval. So continuous on um, on the closed interval. Yes, right, and it's continuous on that closed interval because well. <clears throat> um, we know that the domain is just for all the values that are greater than zero, right? And it's continuous everywhere, everywhere in that region. And this region, one to two, is within that overall interval. All right, now, differentiable. It's a differentiable on the open interval from one to two. Well, let's find out. Let's take the derivative, all right? And in here, I need to use the product rule, right? So what do I get? I get the derivative of the first one times the second log base two of x plus the derivative of the second one over x ln of two times the first x. And in here, well, let's see. Well, how does this simplify? In here, well, these x's cancel each other out, right? So I just have really have here log base two of x plus 1 over ln of 2. And that will be my derivative. All right. Now, is there any issue with that? Like, is there anywhere where this doesn't exist? Well, yes. And here the domain would be, for, for the derivative here, the domain would be, again, x is greater than 0. But that's not an issue because we're working in between 1 and 2, and everywhere between 1 and 2, x is greater than 0. So, is this differentiable? All of this tells us yes. So we have continuous, we have differentiable. So now, what that implies is that the mean value theorem applies. All right. So, and recall that the mean value theorem told us that f prime of c is equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Right. So it's telling us that. The slope of the secant line is equal to the slope of the tangent line somewhere. All right. So let's see. What does that give us? Well, f prime of c, that would have been um, log base 2 of c plus 1 over ln of 2. And we're saying this has to equal to f of b over f of, excuse me, f of b minus f of a. Recall that the interval we were working in was 1 and 2. So f of 2 minus f of 1 over 2 minus 1. All right. <clears throat> Reminder, f of x was x log base 2 of x. So what does this give me? So let's see. Log base 2 of c is equal to plus 
1 over ln of 2. That's going to give us, well, let's see. 2 minus 1 is 1. f of 2, so plug in 2. So I get the 2 log base 2 of 2 minus f of 1. 1 log base 2 of 1. Okay. Log base 2 of 1. Well, in general, log of any base of log any base of 1 is 0. Log base 2 of 2, that's 1. So what I really have here on the numerator is um, 2 minus 0, right? 2 times 1 minus 1 times 0, so and everything over 1. So that's just 2. And next thing I'm going to do here, I want to solve for C here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this using the change of base formula. All right. And if you recall, the change of base formula was as follows. Log base A of B is equal to log base C of B over log base C of A, where we go to whatever base we want. And here I'm just going to go to ln because I already have an ln over here. So I'm going to write this as ln of C over ln of 2 plus 1 over ln of 2. Next thing I'm going to do, multiply both sides by ln of 2. So I end up with ln of C plus 1 is equal to 2 ln of 2. Subtract 1. ln of C is equal to 2 ln of 2 minus 1. Solve for C. So I need to exponentiate both sides, right? So what I'm doing is this, exponentiating. On the right side, I end up with just C. On the, excuse me, on the left side, I end up with just C. On the right side, well, I'm just going to leave it as e to the 2 ln of 2 minus 1, whatever that value is. Well, let's see. What does this really say? This is really saying e to the ln of 4 minus 1, right, in the exponent. All I did was apply rules of logs, brought the 2 to the exponent up here. Um, what else can I see here? Well, this becomes e to the ln of 4 times e to the negative 1, right? That's from um, the product of same base, different exponents. Normally, you add them. Well, now I'm just going the other way around. Now, in here, what does that give me? Well, e to the, e to the ln of 4 is just 4. So I get that c is equal to 4e to the negative 1, otherwise known as 4 over e. All right? Now, if you're wondering, well, E is 2.7 and change, so 4 over that is going to be approximately 1.47 with a whole bunch of other stuff, all right? All right, so let's see what we found here. Um, we found the value of C that was guaranteed by the mean value theorem, right? So if I look at the visual, let's look at the visual. The visual for this is at least in that specific uh, interval from 0 to 2, let's say, excuse me, from 1 to 2, let's say here's 1 and here's 2. Well, this is what the function looks like. Um, so how, how am I finding this? Well, I'm plugging in 1, right? 1 into here, 1 times log base 2 of 1. Well, log base 2 of 1 is 0, 0 times 1 is 0. So on that endpoint, at 1, we have 0. If I plug in 2, log base 2 of 2, that's 1. 2 times 1 is just 2. So that tells me that, for example, here, that's going to be at the height of 2. This is not drawn to scale, right? Um, and the function here looks kind of like this. Um, well, let me make that better. Right, it kind of looks like that. What do we find here? Well, we found that there's this tangent line, right? That tangent line exists, and maybe I'll draw it better. Way better. Good job, me. So that tangent line exists, right? Not, not tangent line, that secant line exists. That secant line exists, and the slope for that secant line was um, f of b minus f of a over b minus a, right? Whatever that is. Um, well, it was 2, right? It's 2. That's what we found over there. So that slope equals 2. And we found that at this point, somewhere in between the two, 
somewhere between one and two, we have a tangent line that's horizontal. Excuse me, that's tan. Well, that's parallel. There we go. English is hard, guys. So in here, ooh, missed. There we go. Well, maybe I'll shift this over. No, nah, that's fine. I'll just make it bigger and say that that's where it's the tangent line. So in here, this is the value for over E, right? And here, the slope is also equal to 2, right? That's what we found here, that point. All right, so let's do one last example before I end this video. So that was example G, I believe, right? Where is it? G, okay. H. So let's do a word problem. The height of an object T seconds after it is dropped from a height of 300 meters is given by this function s of t is negative 4.9 t squared plus 300 all right so it's in free fall the first question that i'll ask here is find the average uh, velocity of the object during the first three seconds Right. We will ask another question, but let's, let's, let's start with this. Find the average velocity of the object within the first three seconds. Well, what is that really saying? What this is really saying is we want the average velocity. So, average velocity. Well, that's given by S of, let's do it this way. S of B minus S of A over B minus A. All right. So during the first three seconds, what does that mean? That means that we're working on the interval between zero and three. All right. So that's during the first three seconds. So in here we have S of three minus S of zero over three minus zero. The denominator is easy, just three. The numerator, plug in three. Well, we've got negative 4.9 times three squared. Well, three squared um, is nine, right? So we have negative 4.9 times 9 and then that minus 300 which gives me negative 344.1 minus s of 0 we we'll plug in 0 that's just 300 and at that point um, negative 344.1 minus 300 just ends up being negative uh, excuse me negative 644.1 and hold on did i mess that up yes i did i subtracted i was supposed to add so this value is wrong um we had to do negative 4.9 times 9 plus 300 which is 255.9 so let's let's change that you know what let me let me actually write it out so you see the calculations i'm doing on this so plug in three. So the plug in three, I end up with negative 4.9 times three squared. And then we have that plus 300 minus S of zero. So we have zero minus 300. All of this over um, zero plus 300, sorry. 0 plus 300. All of this over 3. I was making the same mistake that I did the first time. Look at that. That's awful. Anyway, in here, 300 minus 300 cancel each other out. So we just end up with negative 4.9 times 3 squared. 
So 3 squared is 9. So 4.9 times 9 is 44.1, right? 9 times 9 is 81. Carry the 8. 9 times 4 is 36, and 8 is 44. But this was negative. So negative 44.1 over 3. And when I divide that over 3, I end up with a proc well, with exactly four, negative 14.7. All right? Um, okay. I want to write that as a fraction of negative 147 over 10. All right? So basically, I, th I thought of this as this over 1 multiplied by 10 over 10. All right? <clears throat> All right. So that's the first question. Cool. Second question. Use the mean value theorem to verify that um, at some point at some point during the first three seconds of fall of falling the object right that was falling the instantaneous velocity equals the average velocity. Okay. So use the mean value theorem to verify that at some point during the first three seconds of falling, the instantaneous velocity equals the average velocity. Okay, so what is that saying? Well, can we apply the mean value theorem? Well, let's figure it out. Is this differentiable and is this continuous? Well, this is continuous throughout all, all of um, the real numbers, right? This function right here, it doesn't matter what value of t you plug in, it's continuous, it's a polynomial. And polynomials are actually differentiable everywhere, right? Even if I take the derivative here, which, well, even if I did take the derivative, because poly polynomials are differentiable everywhere. So this is continuous and it's differentiable. So the mean value theorem does apply. Now, how does that apply here? Well, it's talking about the instantaneous velocity. Recall the instantaneous velocity in terms of graphs is really talking about um, the slope of the tangent line at that given point. So the instantaneous velocity here is going to be s prime of t. So what we have here, it's asking us to verify that s prime of t is equal to s of t, excuse me, s of b. Oh, hold on, not s prime of t. I don't want to use t. s prime of c is s of b minus s of a over b minus a. So, s prime of c, well, let's figure out what f, s prime of x of t was. So, s prime of t would have been negative 9.8t, right? Because it was, um, where is it? 4.9t squared, bring the 2 down, negative 9.8. This constant goes away. So, that tells me that, well, negative 9.8c, right, s prime of c, is equal to s of b minus s of a over b minus a. We already figured that out, right? That was part a. s of b minus s of a over b minus a. And we got negative 147 over 10. So this has to be equal to negative 147 over 10. All right, let's rewrite this. Negative 9.8, that's negative 98 over 10. And this is negative 147 over 10. Multiplying both sides by negative 10, I end up with 98c is equal to 147, so that c is 147 over 98, all right? Now, this actually reduces. Um, these are both divisible by 49, all right? 98 divided by 49 is 2. 147 divided by 49 is 3. And look at that, 3 halves? Well, that is somewhere in the interval, right? Because it is definitely within the first three seconds. So what we found here by the mean value theorem is that at the time of three halves, the instantaneous velocity is equal to the average velocity. All right, and that was by the mean value theorem, all right? 
So that concludes 4.2. Wasn't that fun? If you think I made a mistake somewhere, you're probably right. Tell me all about it in the comments. If you feel you learned something from me in this video, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, but more importantly, share it. Share this video with your classmates. And remember, you don't have to like math in order to be good at it. But you do have to be good at it. I am Jose Orozco. Goodbye.